mission to improve literacy in Northwest Arkansas through fundraising, outreach, and regular literary programming. You can find out more about us at www.ozarkbookauthority.com. Today, we are welcoming guest authors J.C. Crumpton, Nita Gold, and John Horner Jacobs for Arkansas Gothic, a discussion of Arkansas history, folklore, and ghost stories, and their impact on our author's work. So first, authors, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. And we can start with Nita. Hello, and first of all, I want to thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this today. Appreciate it. Um, I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and my mother's family is from Northwest Arkansas. So I've been visiting there my entire life. Uh, I've never lived there. I hope to one day. Um, the book that I've written is my only book. I never really thought of myself as an author. I thought of myself as a researcher who had a family story to tell. So for my profession, I'm in information technology. And when I was growing up, I never thought I would write a book. So that's me. <laughs> uh, John, what about you? Uh, my name is John Horner Jacobs. I am an author of mostly novels, but short fiction. I've had fiction and essays appear in Playboy magazine, CBS Weekly, Huffington Post. Um, I'm probably best known for my first and most recent books. Uh, the first book is called Southern Gods. Uh, my most recent book is called A Lush and Seething Hell, and there's about eight or nine in between. Um, I've written um, young adult novels. I've written um, a fantasy series, and I've written a bunch of horror, um, and I am happy to be here. And I, I live in Little Rock, so I've lived all my life in um, Arkansas with a few stints outside. Um, I've written about the Delta. I've written about the Ozarks. I've written, you know... I, um, I have a complicated relationship with Arkansas. <laughs> I can relate. I've, I've been here my entire life. <laughs> so, uh, JC, what about you? Uh, my name is JC Crumpton. Thanks for having me. And I write multiple genres. Um, I have been published in everything from historical, par paranormal historical fiction, which was my novel, Silence in the Garden, which is about the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And I have published in science fiction, fantasy, western, horror, thriller, and poetry as well. And I have lived around the world, but I have lived mostly the last 30 years here in Arkansas. Very cool. Um, you guys kind of already answered my first question about what genre you write. Uh, but Nita, uh, why don't you go into a little bit more detail about uh, your book? Okay. Well, my book is Remembering Ella, a 1912 murder and mystery in the Arkansas Ozarks. It's the true story about the murder of my 18-year-old cousin. Her name was Ella Barham. She lived in northwest Arkansas in Boone County and she was murdered in 1912. So I discovered this story uh, a long time ago, probably sometime in the mid 80s when I was with my mother uh, in that area because my family still has a house there. And so I wrote this book about my cousin's murder. So uh, our next question, first question, <laughs> Wait, wait, can, wait! Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Anita. Yes. So, were you friend? Like, did you know her? No, she she was murdered in 1912, and I'm not oh, okay. that old yet. So, I'm sorry, I missed the 19. <laughs> I, I missed the 1912 part. I apologize. My mother. I'll, I'll explain that a little better. My mother was uh, born and raised in that area, and I actually own her parents' house, mm -hmm. my grandparents' house. So, I've been going there my whole life. And so that's my connection to Arkansas. And my cousin uh, that was murdered was murdered less than five miles from where my house is. So it's I a mean, family I, story and it's close to me, right? I could, I could ask a lot of questions just about what you, you're um, like. So, it, uh, I mean, it must, it must be um, really um, interesting to, or in, in like uh, personal, when you're researching a book and which has a family connection on something that gruesome. Yes, um, it was very personal, and at times it was very difficult uh, because of the manner in which she was murdered and the circumstances surrounding it. But I am by trade an analyst, 
So I'm trained by trade to be objective and analytical. And I think that was what saved me in writing this book. Otherwise, I don't think emotionally I could have finished it. It was pretty emotional for me at times, but I did my best uh, to be objective and to not insert myself into what I was writing, but just remain with the facts. And I've actually gotten some pretty good reviews that said I did a good job with that. So I feel like I was successful, which is good. That's what I strove to do. That's fascinating. I apologize, Brooke, if I asked a question you had planned. I was just excited. Oh, no, about, it's perfectly fun. It's great. I, 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 I was excited about what, her story. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So uh, kind of bouncing off of that, um, Nita was obviously inspired to write her book because of the true story of uh, her relative. Um, so to ask John and JC, so what element or story or location within Arkansas folklore or history inspired your work, uh, John? Oh, oh, oh me? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of little things. Like I reference Arkansas throughout a lot of my novels, even my secondary world novels. Uh, I refer reference it in, in little ways like, you know, naming a, you know, a fantasy town in like some mountains, like hot springs or something like that, or like a translation of hot springs or, you know, just like little, little quirky things like, you know, um, but in my most recent book, a, a lush and seething hell, um, it has two short novels in it. Um, the first one was nominated for a Shirley Jackson award. The second one, my heart struck sorrow. Uh, is nominated for the World Fantasy Award, and I just got to throw that out there because I'm probably about to lose it, and I can't really talk about it after I lose it. No, that's um, awesome, though. I, I want to uh, just like pop in to say that's really, really cool. Yeah, <laughs> well, Congratulations! It's, it's nice. Um, uh, so the, the second book is about an uh, ethnomusicologist who um, travels the South uh, in the 1930s, uh, searching for the um, the uh, sort of missing the, the fabled infernal verses of a song called Stagger Lee. Um, Stagger Lee is a very well-known song. Um, probably the most commonly known version of it is uh, by Lloyd Price. But it's been, it, it's been covered. Uh, it's a folk song. It's in, the, it's in the public domain, and it's been covered by hundreds, if not thousands, of, of people. And in it, it describes a murder... Um, by Stagger Lee of Billy Lyons, and it, it, it varies from region to region, from place to place. The details are always different, uh, but usually uh, Stagger Lee dies at the end of it. Um, in the sort of infernal verses of the song, uh, he goes to hell and, be and kills the devil and becomes king of hell himself, uh, which was this ethnomusicologist um, uh, 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 those are the verses he's hunting for. Um, and it's based on a real bit of, of American history, which is the story of Alan Lomax. Alan Lomax was an ethnomusicologist who worked for the Library of Congress, who traveled America recording field hollers <coughs> and prison songs. And he, he did a lot of recording in Arkansas and Mississippi and Tennessee and Alabama and North Texas, East, you know, everywhere. Um, and, you know, most of the rock songs you hear in the 70s uh, by, like, the Sloop, Sloop John B. by the Beach Boys, 60s and 70s. Sloop John B. was originally a field holler, a, a Negro field holler. Is, is literally, it comes from the um, a, um, a album called Negro Prison Songs. Or I'm not, you know. Uh, um, so um, th that, that was the basis of it. There's actually a real story I based uh, that Alan Lomax chased Lead Belly all over West Memphis and Memphis. <laughs> trying to get these verses out of him. But Lead Belly was like, all right, I'll sing you another verse if you buy me a drink, but we're going somewhere else. And so that's sort of what sort of was the impetus for me writing this book. Anyway, long, <coughs> long, uh, long story. No, oh, that's super interesting. I love that. That's great. Uh, so JC, what about you? What part of Arkansas uh, folklore inspired you? Well, um, obviously, it was the Crescent Hotel. Uh, the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs is considered one of the most haunted hotels in the United States. And so it was, uh, well, it was just a few miles north of the town where I lived when I went to high school. 
And so I would always go up there with my group of friends and we would explore the different sites and we heard about the haunting of the Crescent Hotel and so we would go up and down through all the halls and then actually one of our friends, his mother became the manager of the hotel. And so that gave us a little even better access. And so we were ghost hunters, basically, going through all these things. And so I learned a lot about the, the history of, or what they thought was the history of the ghosts. And when I decided to, I just, one day I just decided to put it all down on, on paper. And, and it was because of my experiences with that hotel itself. Though, personally, I never found a ghost but I talked to a lot of people who have had experiences. Um, my brother-in-law and his wife had one of their anniversaries in, in there, and they told me some stories that they experienced while they were there. Um, the Up on the top floor is, a, well, now it's a pizza restaurant, but it used to be called Doc Baker's Lounge. And I'd go up there and I'd talk to the bartender for hours and hours, and she had all kinds of stories about the place and, and nothing that she had personally experienced, but all the other employees that would talk to her. And so, I mean, I got a list of all the different ghosts that could have been there. And I just put them all together in this book. I learned the history that the Crescent, the Crescent hotel used to be the um, Crescent college conservatory for young women back in the twenties. And I based my story at that time. So, and that's what influenced me because it was it was history. It was right there in, in my backyard. Yeah, no, that's really cool. I still haven't been to the Crescent Hotel. I've lived here for uh, ten years now, and I still have never been. <laughs> so I don't ghosts freak me out. So you got to go. When it's I was a beautiful a, building too. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's fantastic. When I was a musician in my 20s and 30s, we would play there often and they would often set us up with rooms. And um, that was always fun to, you know, wander the halls. I, and, and then it was interesting because I got invited to a book event there uh, like, you know, a couple of few years ago. And we stayed in this little out, this side house. But um, there's ghost tours there now mm -hmm. uh, all the time. I mean, probably not in, in pandemic, but um it's it's they're really monopolizing on the most haunted hotel in um, America or whatever. Yeah, yeah I uh, I think I picked up a pamphlet for the the haunted tours um, earlier this year, and then the pandemic happened. So. <laughs> yeah, the, like the the uh, your, uh, it also has a fantastic brunch with oh. locks and omelets. I'm just just throwing that out there. For I you. love breakfast, so I will take that recommendation. Yeah. So um, going into our next question, uh, so what sort of research did you do as part of writing your book? And I know, Nita, you've done a lot of really yeah. interesting primary source research. I'd love to hear about uh, what you did for yours. Well, I tried to make a list of everything last night just so I could remember everything. And I, I finally just gave up. <laughs> this is the, the list is too long. Um, I relied on a lot of primary source documents newspapers. I had, I think, over 500 newspaper articles. Um, all of the legal documents surrounding my cousin's, um, the, the trial for the person who was eventually convicted of her murder. Uh, he had a, uh, of course, a regular trial, and then his case was appealed to the Arkansas State Supreme Court, so I have those records. And then his attorney tried to get the case heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. So I have some of those records as well. Those were instrumental. And I consider them to be the sources that were closest to the truth. So I kind of wrapped everything else around them. Um, lots of books about Arkansas history, especially academic books on the Ozarks. Historians. I've got uh, some friends who are historians because of this. And I think a lot of them because they put a lot of time into what they do and learn. Uh, dissertations that people have written. There was one dissertation that a lady wrote on some 1910 axe murders that was kind of interesting. Uh, I studied early 20th century law, criminal law. That was fun. Uh, death certificates, lots of things that you would find in genealogy, right? Because I'm researching the times and the people. So like death certificates, cemetery records, gravestones, 
marriage records, military records, property tax records. And one of the things that really was very helpful to me is I inherited all of Ella's remaining personal belongings, which is a collection of letters and postcards that uh, men and some women wrote to her from 1909 up until right the time of her death. And there were also some women who wrote her mother after her death. And I have some of those letters. So that gave me some special insight. Maps, lots and lots of maps, uh, land records to help reconstruct where things were at the time. Uh, Civil War pension applications. I mean, it really runs the gamut, you know, and then people too. I interviewed a number of people, but you have to be really careful, I think, with oral history because it's history and it gets distorted over time as it's passed down from generation to generation. So I think it can give you a lot of good leads. Uh, and I think that those leads need to be corroborated with other sources to really gain the truth. So those are some of the high points of my research. I could go on and on, but those are some of the main things. I well, and that was part of like your whole reason for writing the book too, was to kind of dispel those, those myths and the folklore that's, around her death. Right. That's correct. Because uh, you can just do a Google search on her name and you can find ghost stories. Uh, there's books that have been written about her. And here's one. I'll show you this. If anybody can see that. Um, all kinds of things, easy to find. And, uh, and they're usually based in, there's a grain of truth, right? In almost any folklore, there's a grain of underlying truth, but it, it just takes some wild bents at times. So my whole intention, as you said, was to tell the whole story as much as I could find over a long period of time and to dispel all of the facts or the, excuse me, to bring out the facts and dispel all the folklore and the myths that have come about the last hundred years. I think that's great. Like, it's funny because, you know, thematically it's, you're kind of like the antithesis <laughs> to the topic, but uh, it's really fascinating how you took those stories and, and found the truth. I think it's great. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, John, you mentioned uh, kind of taking bits and pieces of Arkansas and hiding them in your work and, and things like that. But have you done any sort of in-depth research or study uh, to better bring out, um, I guess, Arkansas in your work? Uh, well, yes. I mean, because uh, uh, Election Seething Hell takes place in 1938, Arkansas, I, I uh, so one of the great things about being a, 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 I'm writing fiction as opposed to um, our historical fiction, but as opposed to nonfiction, is there's not this rigor of um, of academic accuracy. So what I do is I read uh, widely and copiously about the era and the place, yes. and just sort of let it filter through my awareness and pick and choose the um, the, uh, the details I want to share because both of the short novels in, in that book are, uh, historical fiction. One takes place in a fictitious South American country in the eighties. And the other one is in, uh, as we said, um, I do a lot of research. So uh, enough that I include a, uh, all my source books at the end of my novel. Mm -hmm. Um, so <clears throat> so there's countless books. Uh, I mean, not, not countless. There's about, I think, 15 or 20 uh, like direct reference books, a lot of which were written by Alan Lomax for that story, plus a bunch of other uh, just regional books, um, some weird ones. I also have a, a, one thing. I'm writing a, a book right now in Hungary set in the 1800s, and I, I need a lot of research for that. Great, You know, the great thing is I don't have to. I, I mean, verac you know, you include these details for veracity sake to lure the reader in and to, um, you know, have them, um, you know, stop disbelief. You know, I have to tr they have to trust me enough that I'm a good enough storyteller by feeding them these details that I know what the hell I'm talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
uh, one of, uh, another resource, uh, resource for something like that is JSTOR, which is an online um, academic paper uh, site. You can pay for them, which I end up doing more than I like. Um, if I had a, if I had some affiliation with the university, I could probably just use the university thing, but I'm just, uh, just some guy. Um, but the good thing is I write, I can, I'm just write all that off on taxes, but, um, uh, JSTOR is a good resource for anything you want to resource research. That's true. I have to chime in on that and say, I, I second that motion. It is a very good resource. And, and and it's it's weird the way I'm pronouncing it. And if uh, we could put it in the text, it is J S T O R. And I couldn't tell mm -hmm. you off the top of my head what the that that acronym is for. It's like journals, scientific. I don't know, but um, you can find it online easy enough. And and you can make a free account if you are a writer. You can make a free account and you can download I think ten or fifteen or twenty papers to start off with free. So it's it's come in real handy for like looking up like what what does what does the eighteen hundreds Hungarian dress as or mm -hmm. whatever you know uh, or what is their garb or what you know so it's uh that's that's those are sort of my techniques. Yeah, I've used that as well. Um, I also tend to write historical based fiction, and um, the current thing I'm working on is thirteenth century Scotland. <clears throat> and so um, I'm having to do a lot of research and uh, I'm kind of like you in that I just read a bunch about the era and just absorb as much of it as possible. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a good Scottish accent? Aye, lassie. Aye. <laughs> That's really a pirate, but you got you to gotta have a good Scottish accent. To That's true. The, I need to, to practice on it probably. <laughs> so I, I have a question for you. Um, when you do all of this historical research, at what point, I mean, there must be something creative that kicks in at some point that makes you want to create a story about it that is fiction. And, you know, my mind just doesn't go that way, right? Because I tend to be, you know, I'm nonfiction. So how does that work? I mean, do you just, do you get an idea about the place and the time first? Uh, where does this begin in the creative process with you? You just think, I want to start writing about Scotland and or yeah, John. Me? John, you answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so I like horror. I mean, I'm a horror hound. I like horror movies. I like vampires, zombies, uh, uh -huh. ghosts. I like all that that stuff. Um, I can tell you specifically, the book I'm writing is sort of Dracula adjacent, right? Um, and uh, I was reading a uh, a book called um, uh, Organized Crime and Antiquity. Right. That was the book I was reading. And it's this just like essays about <clears throat> about organized crime. And, and like in, in, in history, a lot of the a lot of what you think of as patriarchs, as men, men, men of influence and his, his people of historical import um, were really like uh, amassing power through criminal enterprise um, <laughs> uh, like you know, it goes through Greece and everything. And, and I was thinking about uh, that in relationship to, because um, uh, I was thinking about doing a Dracula-esque sort of um, story and, and that deals with uh, the, you know, patri the, the patriarchy, right? Um, and so that was sort of like this the starting point. And, and then I started thinking, well, you know, Dracula in um, the book by Bram Stoker is like, He's super powerful. He's a vampire, but homeboy, like he he is, he has no servants. He like in Tran in Transylvania, he has to go down to Borgo Pass and pick up Jonathan Harker and like act like he's the coachman, and you know, and hide his and, and he has to do all his own errands. And it's like if this guy was a lord of of Carpathia, you know, if he was just like Lord, he would have at some point had power and servants and influence in the region. And I was more interested in sort of that. And so I thought, well, if he's, you know, this vile, evil, you know, man, he would have, he would have tried to consolidate power in, through, or, you know, crime, the, the channels of crime, right? Um, that's how men of that time did. And it's through indentured servitude. It's through, um, it's through really milking the populace, not bleeding the populace of their wealth. Hmm. And, and, and so I, I really sort of, uh, that, that was the sort of impetus for the idea. So I'm, I, I've been exploring really Dracula more like a, 
you know, a remnant of 17th century Lord of the Carpathian mountains rather than the v vampire, uh, which he still is. But I mean, so that was my sort of idea behind it. So in some ways you're trying to inject some reality into your stories as you would see it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like uh, every, every novel, every story, whatever, whatever, however fantastical it is has to be grounded in, in, some sort of truth. Now we, we get to play with um, what that truth is and how, how we deal with it, you know, um, but, but if it doesn't have, uh, let's, let's not say truth, let's say uh, uh, the ring of truth, like, you know, ultimately we're dealing with the human condition and, you know, the, hum the pr pr propensity of, of the human condition. So, uh, there are land barons out there that would, that I'm looking at that do the exact same things that uh, Dracula does. Just they don't also drink blood. They just do it, you know, economically. Um, so that is, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we try to use as much truth as we can, as long as it's exciting. And you kind of touched on it before. It's like bringing authenticity in to maintain the suspension of disbelief and to kind of ground your fiction and fantasy in reality. Yeah. That's how I approach it. So I agreed. I mean, uh, uh, David Mitchell, and I'm sorry, I think JC needs to has something to say, but, uh, David Mitchell, uh, the guy who wrote the cloud Atlas, um, he has this simple rule that in any scene, if you can give three had to be there details about what's going on, like that are just individual to that scene that, those like on a granular level of, of engaging the reader, those are what you do. Like the smell of something, the feel of something, uh, and, you know, like the way, you know, the condition of something uh, he's got to, you know, it, and it works. Uh, it really does. Cause it's like, um, it, you know, he, I can't, I can't remember exactly what he calls it, but it's some goofy elision of like three words, like had to be there or whatever. But um, it, it's, it's a, it's a good technique. So, JC, uh, what kind of research did you do as part of writing Silence in the Garden? Um, it was extensive. It was lots of walking, lots of talking. Um, spent a lot of time in the Eureka Springs Library, which was it's a, which is this amazing goth building in itself. Big gray columns and big mm -hmm. stairs going up to it. It's uh, and then when you get inside there, it's just as amazing. We've got old um, mahogany um, fixtures you've got uh, an upstairs which is actually almost like a balcony inside the building where a lot of their older documents are and I went through a lot of those um, a lot of it was learning just about the 20s what what really happened on the 20s and and uh, the 20s were were I, I learned that they were in a, an exciting um, time not you know everybody talks about you know okay well things weren't you know we didn't have you know everybody was you know uh, uptight tight collar everything like that but no the 20s were there's a reason they were called the roaring 20s i mean they had um these things called petting parties i mean it was like you know you get you think about this and you think about your your grandparents you're like going oh, wow they were kind of <laughs> living on the edge sort of thing but you got to got to put all those details in just like john was saying mm -hmm. you go through all this all this all through the details just so you can put just a, a couple things into the story that make make the reader say oh yes this is very plausible this was probably there we he's been there he knows this um as i was doing my research on specific topics within the story that i wrote silence in the garden i created a character i thought i was creating him and this this is a, a, is a weird story i thought i was creating the the um superintendent of the school the the principal of the and it turns out that the guy i created was exactly the one who really was there who was actually became a an arkansas senator richard thompson and he's the guy who founded ozarka waters so it was like it, 
it was like, though I never found any ghosts, it was like somebody was whispering in my ear <laughs> as I was doing this, this, this book and doing all the research. Into it. I had to look at lots of old pictures. What did the area look like? And that's why I put, a, I have a character in there who is the descendant of the owner of a logging company because the Ozarks that we see around us are, is not the Ozarks that was there in the 20s and 30s. It was almost barren of, of trees because of the logging industry. It was just totally, and that's really what kind of added to the, the Great Dust Bowl in the 30s was the in, improper farming techniques in Oklahoma and Kansas and all that area. But then also, as that wind was coming through this area, it picked up all the dirt because there was, there was no roots to protect it here in the Ozarks. And so, you know, I have it. Um, Silence in the garden. There's a garden in at the hotel, but for the most part, the 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 area is barren. And so you you have to learn that sort of thing. You have to be able to to put that in because you know as soon as you put something in incorrectly, someone's going to find it and they're going to call you out on it. And, and you're just like going, well, great. That's you know, everything's up in the air. <laughs> but no, it's it's lots of lots of papers, lots of talking, lots of roaming around i mean i just roamed that that town so much i went down and talked to um a lady at the at the at the lake that i that i have in the book she owns the resort there and she started telling me about the connection between the crescent hotel and this lake and so i'm like oh, okay well then i have to add this into it and make it a real part of the story so as i have a question for you again that it's kind of a similar question you know you're you're finding all of this fascinating history that's real I mean, right. so why don't you just write about that? I mean, where does it, why, why do you have the need? Um, I'm asking this just as a general question of fiction authors, right? Because I'm not one. Why do you have a need to take something that's so rich in history, that's so interesting all on its own and make something else up? Where does that, where does that come from inside you? And, you know, you do what? all this research and, and what you said is great. And, I can relate to what both you and John have said about getting to know the era and the time period. I mean, I'm, I've seeped myself into um, Ozark's history and I love it. And I, you know, that's probably where I will stay if I continue to write. Um, but there's so much there already. Why do you feel a need to change that? I'm just curious, especially with the Crescent, because there's so much already there that's real you know well, i'm not i'm not interested in being an academic I, i'm interested in telling yeah. stories that are that are exciting and engaging right so, and I, i'm not an academic i've had two history classes in my life you but know, i mean but but ultimately <laughs> you are in the sense if you if you write his, if you write a non-fiction about history you are an academic because you have to do right. all the research that the, like you you went on for about five minutes listing all your sources mm -hmm. um like, like, like that is not my, my intention is not to um, uh, to uh, tell every detail of history. My intention right. is to tell an exciting story that talks about some part of the human condition and uh -huh. do it on something that I'm interested in right. and with a subject matter that I think uh, th that I prefer. Mm -hmm. um, but like what, like the question of like, why don't you just write about Hungary in the 1800s oh. instead of telling the story? Right. It, it seems to be like, it, it has a value proposition in it that I'm not t entirely down with. Uh -huh. Like, wh why don't you write, why don't you write, why don't, when you write your story about your, your, um, why don't you write fiction and make it a better story with a good resolution? Like I mean, you can turn that. You can turn it around. Yeah. Like, why, why don't you? Why don't you? Why don't you write? Why don't you write something that's a little bit not fun, more fun to read? Right. Like, you know. Um, so I mean, it's just like it's personal preference. I don't yeah. like. I don't like Brussels sprouts. Right. I don't argue with anyone else who does like Brussels sprouts. Well, you're completely wrong, John, because Brussels sprouts are delicious when they are roasted. They are. No, I, I agree with John. I agree with John. I'm asking. About you the present because it is a fascinating place and because it's the Ozarks, you know, and I love it. So, and, it's, and I'm, well, the, the, where the does it turn for you? Where you, you does your mind start going, oh, wow, you know, I could add here and this would be, I mean, I'm well, just the story is really just a setting. It. Huh? The story is really just a setting. The, the Crescent is just the setting. The actual story <laughs> is actually about the battle between class distinction. Oh. Um, um, so that, and I put that in there, the, the, um, 
the, the main characters are, you know, because the Crescent College Conservatory for Young Women was a private college and mm-hmm. they attended to the wealthy. And that was because of the economic situation at the time, the hotel was suffering. And so they had to open the college so that they could bring more money in. And one of the other characters is the daughter of the driver of a senator. And so he, she basically is, has a scholarship. And so it's about that, that battle between those, those two groups of people. And that's what the real story is about. It's not the story of the Crescent. It's the story of that battle. And those just happen to be the things that create the ghost. I see. I think that's a really good point. Like talking about all of this research and stuff goes into like, it's a setting. It's this, you know, it's the atmosphere. It's the feeling that you get by having a story set in this place. And you can have those, you know, realistic details and maybe some truthful details, but it's like the story isn't really about that history. And that's kind of how it is for me is I just get obsessed with something and I want to learn about it and it turns into a book. (laughs) Um, And it really boils down to, for me, the reason I don't write history uh, like nonfiction is I like magic. (laughs) Yeah. And magic isn't real. (laughs) That's right. And I really, I really respect people like you um, three who have such creative minds. And that's really what's driving my questions because my mind doesn't work like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm always interested in how you, how you think and what gives you ideas for your stories. And I totally understand the, the setting as a background, you know, but at what point does the creativity take over? Cause that doesn't happen to me, right? It's not, not part of my chromosome. So it's like, how does that work? You know, I'm just curious about it. It's, it's great that you can do it. I mean, I sent one of my best friends, is a fiction writer and she tells stories about um, Oklahoma and she weaves a lot of Oklahoma history into her books and I'm just fascinated by it. You know, every time I read one of her new books, I'm like, wow, how do you think of this stuff? So you guys do phenomenal work with what you do. I mean, there's no way I could be that creative. (laughs) The funny thing is I was talking about this with my wife last night and I said, you know, one of the things you learn as as a burgeoning writer is, you know, write what you know. And I actually put a lot of the situations that I have found myself in, into my stories. I just blow them up and make them Mm -hmm. much more exciting than what really happened. (laughs) So it's like you write what you know, because, and that's why you do all the research. So you know it and you set the setting and then you just put that story in there. You, you, you make it something more than what it is. Mm -hmm. So it feeds your creativity to learn about it. Yes. I see. So um, I want to move on to our next uh, question topic. Uh, So what is an interesting detail about Arkansas that either has or hasn't made it into your work? Something that you find really fascinating. Um, Start with Nita. Uh, Well, I'm going to give you one of those dry, boring academic answers. (laughs) Um, the legal system interests me. Um, early early legal systems in Arkansas, I think, would be kind of interesting to look into. I don't want to go into too much detail because I don't want to give away too many of my ideas, but uh, it would not be dry. It would not be boring because um, I'm really not an academic. I mean, like I said, I haven't studied history very much. I've Well, I've studied a lot of Ozark history and Arkansas history, but not formally, okay? Uh, I write because I love the place. And that's why I study it. So my idea has to do with um, different areas, I would say, of the Arkansas Ozarks, focus a little bit on the legal the legal aspects um, of some things. I really can't think too much because I don't want to give my idea away. Um, but uh, something fun. This would be fun. It would not be, I mean, if you looked at all of my book, I don't know how many of you have seen it. It's it's a good sized book and it's very detailed, you know, and it moves pretty quick. I have very short chapters. It, it reads like a story. Um, but the next one I do, I think will be a little lighter, but my goal would still be educational as well as entertaining. You know, I don't want to, I don't like to read some of the dry academic things that I think John, you were alluding to, but, um, you know, there are some really good academic writers out there. I'll say that. You know, I do think I just had a thought as, you know, your book about Ella could 
you know, inspire a fiction writer to write fiction based on your research. Like, it's I kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I I spent so long that, trying to dispel that. But you're right, and you're right. And actually, my friend that's a fiction writer has asked me if she could do something like that. So, yeah. you know, but yeah. I think it's. I think you know, to me both definitely have a lot of value, whether you're, cause I read a lot of nonfiction uh -huh. and because I do write historical stuff and it, it, uh -huh. it inspires me, um, these real stories. So, uh -huh. you know, I think, I don't know. I just think it's cool. Yeah. I mean, some of my favorite books are fiction, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How dare you cross the line? We're not allowed to do the opposite genre. Yeah. Yeah. You, keep, yeah. you keep saying that you're not an academic. Um, I'm going to have to agree with John on here that that you are actually an academic. Um, in in a local you're, academic, you're, right? How you just that? you just you just that? don't have you just don't have the you know the the I guess the certificate on the wall that you have gone to the school or whatever for. But you actually have a knowledge of a certain topic, and that makes you an academic. And um, John is an academic on. Hungry and the yeah. and the, and the, yeah. the, the very poor the, one. Yeah, I, but but I, we but yeah. but you have a knowledge. I have a knowledge about the Crescent Hotel. That's true. And that's, that's history. And so, and that is academic and historical. That we just don't have the the associated paperwork to go with it. But we do yeah. have the experience and the knowledge. So we all, yeah, we all have that in common. Really, we do all the research. So John, uh, what about you? What's a interesting detail about Arkansas that you found in your research or that has made it into your books? I mean, I've got, I, I've got <clears throat> quite um, a few. Um, I'll tell you one that no one re really will nab from me <laughs> uh, because it's real personal. But um, uh, at some point in the future, I, I'm going to write a story set in the 70s. Uh, there used to be uh, on the White River, there used to be there's a place called Jack's Bay, and there's nothing on it now. But in the 70s and early 80s, um, for some for some reason they would let people put like house trailers on gigantic like five ton blocks of styrofoam and have these houseboats lining it that were really just trailers on styrofoam <laughs> in this bay that were sort of uh, hooked to the shore that had shore power because they run electricity, but were hooked to the shore by like cables. And they were, um, I mean, they were just roguish, like gross house trailers on, you know, on pontoons. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I have seen these before. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had one. Um, uh, and its name was Fat City. And uh, there was like a nest of uh, water moccasins living underneath it. Every weekend in summer, uh, my dad, not every weekend, but a lot of the time, my dad, uh, every, you know, every other weekend we'd go there to Jack's Bay. Uh, you know, and you had to you had to motor out to it. There's no, you know, um, and we would fish all, all that area. And, you know, it's a little bit of recent history that, um, you know, I've, I've always just want to write something a little bit more personal about me, um, something I don't have to really research, even though I probably would have to research a little bit more about the 70s that I forgot. But, um, yeah, that's, you know, um, it's just something that's a little bit a little bit less rigorous in the sense that, I, you know, it takes place in a different time. And, um, yeah, I, I think that would be fun, fun to do just tell a straightforward sort of story. Um, not a coming of age story, something, something more aggressive, like a thriller. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really cool. I like that. So JC, what about you? What's an interesting Arkansan detail? Um, what I have found so amazing about Arkansas is it, it has history. I mean, and it's not just, it's not the flyover state that a lot of people think it is. There are so many different intricate stories that have happened here. And that is what really fascinated me and drew me towards the Crescent Hotel, the story for that I wrote for Silence in the Garden. But in doing those research, I, ha I mean, I came across all kinds of different stories. I talked to, to some of the older residents and, you know, and this was, you know, I started the idea for Silence in the Garden well, over over 16 years ago. And so I started doing the research. And so it was a long time in, in coming to fruition. 
but I talked to some old timers um, down like in Madison County, which was just south of Madison, uh, south of Eureka Springs, and the area where you know part of the where part of the Buffalo River starts, you know, the Pettigrew, St. Paul area down there in the Ozarks. Um, that actually used to be a lot bigger than it is now. There used to be saloons, houses of ill repute. And I mean, and this all happened right here. And you, you, you look at, you go through that area and you're like going, there's nothing here but trees and hollows and, and creeks and, and cows and a goat or a horse every now and then. But it's like, there's a history there and there used to be a railroad that came in through the turnaround was right in Pettigrew. But I also heard a story that, um, an old guy told it and he was told it by his grandfather who actually witnessed it. There was this bandit running from the sheriff, running from the sheriff's deputy and went into one of the houses of ill repute and he actually hid under the petticoats of one of the ladies. And so, I mean, those there's just that kind of detail of the history of Arkansas has what that I want to put into, into, into my stories. Um, and actually, because of the, some of the events that have happened down in that area, I'm thinking, you know, my detective Peterson in Silence in the Garden maybe has another adventure that happens, you know, a few years after that. <laughs> because well, there's one story about um, the local vet comes home early and his wife has locked him out of the house and he sees the the rain boots and raincoat of another guy in the in the in the mudroom. And his wife won't let him in, so he realizes what's going on. Well, a few weeks later, that guy's walking through town. The guy who had been who owned the boots was walking through town, walked by the walked out by the feed store, has his kid in his hand, and I, and I did the research on this too. And his head gets blown off by a shotgun that sticks out of the feed store. Well, they arrest the vet, of course, you know, but he 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 claims unwritten law, and he gets off. So it's like, I'm like going, you know, that, that's, that's a, that's a history that you, those are the details that the Arkansas details that I am just fascinated with and want to put into my stories. Okay. Madison County. Yes. Are you writing this down, Nita? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we are coming up on time. So, um, I'd like to give you guys an opportunity to uh, share uh, about your book, your latest work, and uh, where people can find you online. Uh, Nita, would you like to go first? Sure. So Remembering Ella is, uh, it was published by Butler Center Books, which is in Little Rock, and it's distributed through the University of Arkansas Press. So it's available pretty much most places where books are sold. Um, you can buy it from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all the normal booksellers. Uh, my website is rememberingella.com. I also have a Facebook page called Remembering Ella Barham and a private Facebook group. Um, my book has a map in it, and a lot of people are taking the map that's in the book. And they, I mean, I've even had some people that I don't know from Tulsa. Uh, take the map and they go to the location and walk the crime scene. And then they take pictures and post it on my Facebook page in my private group. So uh, you can find some information about things there too. Very cool. So John, what about you? What's your latest book and where can people find you online? I have two books out right now. Um, I have Lush and Seething Hell. Is that reversed? Is it yeah, it's Is clear it reversed? <laughs> what? It looks right to me. Okay, I have The Lush and Seething Hell and Murder Ballads and Other Horrific Tales. Um, uh, Lush and Seething Hell has been really, uh, I've received a lot of, um, well, just good acclaim for it. Um, I have some, some, some exciting news regarding it that I can't talk about, but um, unfortunately it is, this is um, available everywhere. Uh, Murder Ballads and Other Horrific Tales is has the, the sequel, a novella sequel to my um, first novel, Southern Gods, uh, and it has a bunch of other stories that are like it's got like a Viking story, it's got a uh, you know it's got uh, hauntings, um, <laughs> uh, artificial intelligence stories. It's just it's just a smorgasbord of horror, science fiction, fantasy, and crime noir. Uh, <laughs> 
And these are these are out. You can find me at John Horner, H O R N O R. It's almost like horror, but uh, you strike the second R and replace with the N. And uh, I'm on. I'm most active on Twitter. I don't really like Facebook. Um, <laughs> I post. I do a lot of line of cuts um, and art. So um, I uh, I post like art stuff on uh, Instagram. I'm not really a big pusher of books on on Instagram or Facebook, but I do a little bit. I love the title of your new book. That's great. Thanks. Love it. Thank you. All right, JC, what about you? Um, you can get my books anywhere you buy your, your books, uh, barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, even walmart.com. Uh, can you read mine or are, are they reversed? Yeah, they're good. Okay. They're reversed to me. And that's probably why John was also asking. Um, but Silence in the Garden and the Cardboard Heroes is um, a co collection of poetry and short stories, both previously published and new, ju just in this book. And it has a wide range of genres from science fiction, Western, horror, um, fantasy, um, even a thriller that I thought was just a thriller, but somebody read it and they told me that it was a romantic thriller. And so I'm even, guess, I guess I've kind of delved into that aspect. Um, right now I'm working on the edits for my next book that will come out next year, which is a science fiction mystery. And writing wise, I am working on a historical horror about the, about Vikings actually, um, in Greenland and, to some of the questions that Nina asked earlier, you know, how do you look, you know, do your research and then have an idea about it? Well, the idea came along. I was doing some just random research because I'm nerdish like that. I like to just learn things randomly. And I lived in Iceland, so I know about the, the Viking history. And I was looking at Greenland and the historical record there. They have two Viking settlements that happened there. But archaeologically, there's three settlements. And so I'm like sitting there thinking, my mind starts running, and I'm going, what are the events that happened that made the third settlement be written out of history? And so there it becomes the historical horror. There's a horror element to it. Yeah, okay. I could I could talk a whole another hour on Vikings this fall. Oh yeah, <laughs> and, and that's why I've grown the beard so long too, because it's like <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to braid it and I'm going to put the put the little beads in it, and that's going to be my author picture. No, um, <laughs> it, this is two years worth of growth, so it's a uh, I got don't, a little bit longer. Don't put um, any runes. Don't don't get any rune tattoos. <laughs> You'll no, no, I, yeah, I've I was in the navy. I have I have my tattoo from the navy, and I haven't I have decided I'm not going to be adding much more, especially <laughs> as I get older and the skin starts getting wrinkly and things like that. But so, um, um, you can find me at jc-crumpton.com, and um, I haven't updated my blog in a while because of the pandemic. I've been kind of in limbo about a lot of things. I do have a JC Crumpton author on Facebook and my Twitter handle is at Crumpton tales. Awesome. So, so uh, I want to thank you guys again for joining uh, us today to talk about your stuff. Um, thank you for us. <laughs> and uh, thank you to all of our viewers uh, for joining us today for Ozark book con 2020. Uh, once again, this program is produced by Ozark Book Authority, a local nonprofit with the mission to improve literacy in Northwest Arkansas. You can donate to us at any time at www.ozarkbookauthority.com forward slash donate to help fund events like this one. Um, and actually, we have like maybe one minute left and we have one question uh, from a viewer. Uh, do you believe in ghosts for real or uh, is it all ghost hunters and flavor and dolled up history? Okay. Quick answers, Nita. Yes. John, what about you? Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. Uh, it's like, a fiction writer. It, it, yeah, because I like fiction because it's it is fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's like I I don't believe in magic. I don't you know, um, and ghosts are ridiculous. And um, <laughs> like. Let's just say every person in, in the world has a video camera on them at all times. You'd think they would uh, got a, got a, uh, a photo of a, of a damn uh, ghost um, <laughs> by now. No, there's no such thing. Right. JC, what about you? What do you think? Um, no, but I've seen one. So that's 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 odd. I was I was a child, and I I've I, seen you have done LSD. 
<laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so so no, I um like I said when I did all my research for Silence in the Garden, I never found or saw anything myself and in the years that we were up you know when i was a kid as a teenager ro roaming through the halls up there i never saw anything myself and it's supposed to be the the most haunted and talking about ghost hunters from sci-fi channel they actually had saw something that or they said they saw something that they couldn't explain there at the crescent but i never saw anything like that and i had a lot more years there than they did but you know i, I just I, I like writing about it i'm a fiction writer just like john said <laughs> oh cool so um that's it uh I'm, again thanks and um we've got an interview with jc coming up at 12 uh i believe we've got an interview with john coming up at one and then nita had a reading earlier this morning which we will have a permanent link for tomorrow i believe so um again thanks for joining us and i thank guess you. we'll see you all thank later you. Thank, thank you for having me see you guys Bye. Bye. Bye.